Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for making your way over from the lunch. We really appreciate to have this nice uh, group here. Uh, welcome back to Cornell. Uh, sorry about Tower Road and I don't know how many other things that are blocked, but uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, thrilled to have you chosen to attend, that you have chosen to attend this Liberty Hyde Bailey uh, lecture today, and we'll be taking a close look at modifying the future of food. What if GMOs are the only option? What role should genetically modified organism GMOs play as we try to find a sustainable way to feed the world's growing population? Many argue that they represent an important technological option and possibly the only option for some crops threatened by devastating diseases. Others, of course, are vehemently opposed to the technology. We have a distinguished panel here today, all of whom have some connection with issues related to genetically modified organisms. We hope you'll engage in our discussion and that our panelists will motivate us to do some self-examination about where and why we stand. We'll be hearing from Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Amy Harmon, plant biologist, plant pathologist, papaya breeder, and former Cornell professor Dennis Gonzalez, current professor of plant breeding and genetics Margaret Smith, and Rick Kress, a Cornell alum who's involved with the citrus industry. Margaret's going to discuss the science behind GMOs, while our panelists will cover the challenges faced by the papaya and citrus industries and their biggest hurdle of all, which is public perception. Here's how it's going to work. Each panelist will make a brief presentation outlining his or her experiences related to GMOs. Then we'll have a discussion that I'll moderate, and then we'll open it up for audience participation. I'm going to, we'll, we'll, we'll have that discussion first where I'll provide the questions and then we'll open it up to, to you all and you're going to have about 30 to 40 minutes for, for, for your question. So be thinking uh, of your questions, please. This event is live streamed, so, you know, if you got your <coughs> phones, you know somebody that's going to be interested, why, let them, let them know. It's at, uh, well, I'm not going to try to read it. We written it on the board here somewhere? I don't know. Anyway, alumni.cornell.edu, live stream, future food, with slashes between those last two. So feel free to share it with those who might be interested. The order is going to be Margaret, then Dennis, and then Rick, and then finally Amy. So Margaret, Margaret Smith, received her BS from Cornell in 1978 and her PhD in 82. She joined the Cornell faculty in the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics in 1987. She's the department extension leader, also serves as an associate director of the Cornell Agricultural Experiment Station. Margaret focuses on applied plant breeding, selection, variety testing, and seed issues with a concentration on maize. She also teaches about genetically engineered crop plants in basic public issues education and agriculture in the developing world. Who better to explain some of the science behind GMOs? Please welcome Margaret. Well, thanks very much, Ronnie, and thanks everyone for attending. It's great to see some old friends who are still young, of course, out in the audience, as well as a lot of new faces. Um, I was challenged to present the science behind genetically engineered crops in 10 minutes or less. So, so that's going to be quite the challenge. We'll move along quickly. It's always good to do that right after lunch so you all don't fall asleep. And I thought it would be good to start off with one of my various cartoons. Uh, can people hear now? <laughs> I said a lot of nice platitudes. We'll skip all that. Um, I'm supposed to present the science behind this technology in 10 minutes or less. Um, I thought a good way to start would be with one of my various collection of cartoons about genetically engineered crops that I cut out of the media. This one has the two pigs down there, one saying, it's not the one who participated in the GMO program last year. The other one says, OMG. So I put this up here because it's in complete contrast to my topic of the science. We have not genetically engineered pigs that fly. But I put it up there to make the point that there are many things which are 
myths of one sort or another that tend to become fact out there in the greater realm of information. And that's one of the real challenges I think we face with this technology, as with many others, is helping people sort out what is it we actually know from a scientific point of view, and what that they can read about in many places is actually completely fictional, like the flying pig. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about what genetic engineering is. And really, it's a way to alter the properties of an organism, either by moving genes between organisms that would not normally be cross-compatible, or modifying a gene that already exists within an organism. And that can do one of several things. You can turn genes on and off. We all have all of the genes to do everything we need to do in every cell of our body. We do not want them all expressed at all times. You don't want eyebrows growing on your cheeks, for example. So you don't want those genes working in your cheeks. So you can change when genes are expressed. You can correct what's perceived as a defective gene. This is what we often hear about in the news with human gene therapy. So trying to, for people who have a genetic defect that means they perhaps can't metabolize a particular amino acid, there's the hope that we might be able to go in and fix that so that they could live a more comfortable and healthful life. Or lastly, the nature of most of our genetically engineered crops, which would involve moving a gene from a different host plant, a different species that is not normally cross-compatible. I want to stop for a moment and review genetic material. So as you all would know, the deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is the material of life, the genetic instructions for making an organism. It includes the instructions for producing both the structural products, the things that make up the body of that organism, as well as when and where in the organism's life each of those genes should be expressed for normal development. And miraculously enough, those instructions are written in what amounts to an alphabet of four letters, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or A, T, G, and C, that form the, um, that form the rungs of this ladder over here that is the DNA molecule. And it's the order of those four nucleotide bases that contains all of those instructions. And the most phenomenal thing about DNA it's a few molecules that fit within a cell. The instruction manual is universal. The same four-letter code codes for all the instructions you need if you're a yeast cell, an elephant, an oak tree, a human, a bacterium. It's an incredible thing. And it's that universality of that code that allows genetic engineering to work. Because when you move a piece of genetic code from an organism like a bacterium into an organism like a corn plant, to the corn plant, it just looks like more instructions. The corn plant doesn't read those instructions and they say, oops, here's something that came from a bacterium. What do I do with that? It just reads right along as if it had been there all the time. So that universality, that amazing property of life, is what allows this to work. I'm a geneticist. I like genetics. Can you tell? <laughs> OK. I want to then further draw one distinction, and that's the distinction between traditional crossbreeding which happens to be actually what I do in my own research, and genetic engineering. So when I work with maize or corn, I'll take two different corn types, cross them together, and the offspring, like your kids, will include a mixture of the traits of the two parents. So when we do traditional crossbreeding, we cross two parents that together bring together a range of desirable traits and find among the offspring, you hope, the one that combines the desirable traits from both parents. Genetic engineering, in contrast, can use a variety of a plant and then a donor that might be a completely different species, identify a gene that could be useful to have in that plant, and then by a rather complex process, insert it into the plant. So it's a way to move one or a few genes from a donor organism into a plant. Now, if we stop and think about what we call genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, I want to put this in the context of crop evolution. Our crops all originated with wild ancestors, like this little mustard species that is the wild ancestor of all of our brassica vegetables, and this little tiny indigestible seeds of teosinte, which is the ancestor of our domesticated corn. These things were changed from their wild ancestors to their current cultivated varieties through a process of selection of naturally occurring mistakes that happen when the DNA code is copied. Every time a cell divides, that DNA code has to be copied. So each daughter cell gets its copy. Every time it's copied, just like every time I copy something, 
there's a chance to make an error, and errors happen naturally all the time. Most of them are not desirable, but a few of them make the plant more useful to us. So there's been a, a history of thousands of years of farmer selection and breeder breeding of crops that has transformed the wild's ancestors of our crops into our current cultivated crops, an enormous process of genetic modification upon which we now are adding a new and different way to do that, which is genetic engineering. But I think people often get lost in the notion that our current crops are in some way very natural and the genetically engineered virgins are not natural. Well, the natural things are these ancestors. So if you were really eating only what was natural, GMO suggests we're not, nothing was genetically altered prior to the use of genetic engineering, you'd be eating stuff like this, tiacinte, that mustard, some wild grapes, some grains that have little seeds about the size of your long grass seeds, okay? So we have a long history of thousands of years of genetically altering the crops that we currently consume. Genetic engineering is a new tool on top of that history. The types of genetically engineered crops that are out there right now, there's a number of them that have been engineered with a gene called Bt, derived from a naturally occurring soil bacterium that gives them resistance to insects. Corn and cotton are the predominant ones grown in this country. A number of crops have been engineered to resist herbicides so that weed control is a little more straightforward. I've listed a few of them there, soybean, canola, cotton, corn, alfalfa, there are others. Again, genes derived from bacteria in this case. And then I won't say any more about virus-resistant crops because I think Dennis will cover that exhaustively, but papaya and squash have been also engineered for resistance to viruses. These are the genetically engineered crops you find currently cultivated in the US. There are many misunderstandings about how pervasive this is in other crops. This is pretty much what there is. I want to show you a few graphs and then I'll wrap up. These show the adoption of this technology and this particular picture shows it on a global scale. The scale over on the left here is millions of hectares. Those of you who think in acres, a hectare is about two and a half acres. This runs from 1996 on the left here over to 2013 on the right. So it just shows the total global area of use of genetically engineered crop varieties. You can see it's been quite a steady rise. Um, the largest user, this blue part of the bars down here, is the US, followed by Brazil, Argentina, India, China, and this is all the rest of the countries in the world. So there's a few fairly large users of this technology right now. In the US, the major crops we have that are genetically engineered are field corn, cotton, and soybean. These are similar pictures, except they show percentage of total US area planted to genetically engineered varieties. So this scale runs from none up to 100%. So in field corn, for example, we find about 90% of US acreage is currently planted to genetically engineered varieties, either BT, this yellow, for insect resistance, um, one or another of herbicide tolerance genes in the red, or both of those, which is the orange ones, what we call stacked varieties that have both BT and herbicide tolerance genes in them. From these, you can see, for all three of these major crops, corn, cotton, and soybean, very rapid adoption by growers of these insect-resistant and herbicide-tolerant varieties. Notice as I say that, that those are things which really benefit growers. Insect resistance and herbicide tolerance makes their fields more productive and their management simpler. Not a lot in there for consumers just yet. That's one of the challenges. So to wrap up, my key points, genetic engineering, it's a way to add one or a few genes to a crop plant's genetic material. So it is a new tool that is layered on a long history of crop genetic change. So crop genes have been changed dramatically through domestication and subsequent breeding over thousands of years. The current genetically engineered crops we grow in the US largely benefit farmers and the seed companies that develop them. There are consumer benefits in terms of environmental benefits and perhaps some um, soil preservation, reduced erosion, but those are rather indirect. And we should also know that genetically engineered varieties are planted on 90% or more of US field corn, soybean, and cotton acreage. Ronnie's about to cut me off, and I'm done.
Thank you, Margaret, for that good background. We work in the same department, so we have a sixth sense about when she's finishing and I'm starting. So Dennis Gonzalez, Dennis, you want to make your way up to the podium, was born and raised on a sugar plantation in Kohala, Hawaii. He received his BS and MS degrees from University of Hawaii in 1965 and 68, and his PhD from the University of California at Davis in 1972. Dennis worked at the University of Florida from 1972 to 1977, and at Cornell University from 1977 to May of 2002. While at Cornell, he developed and introduced two new varieties of papaya that were resistant to the papaya ring spot virus, rainbow and sunup. With monumental effort on the part of Dennis, his were the first and only genetically engineered fruits ever to be deregulated in the U.S. Dennis has appointed, was appointed Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor in 1995. He returned home to Hawaii in 2002 to direct and build new facilities of the USDA Pacific Basin Agricultural Research Center in ELO until he retired in 2012. One of his current activities is to deregulate the Hawaiian transgenic papaya in China. Please welcome Dennis. Well, thanks uh, very much. Uh, you know, when I, I came to Cornell, uh, well, I came to here a couple days ago, and and it was cold. And I, you know, I came from Hawaii. So, oh my God! You mean I stayed here for 25 years? But I will tell you, I, I worked at the Geneva campus, and the 25 years were like magic. It it was electricity at the Geneva campus. So we we just had the climate. To do, to do the research and the vision. Because papaya doesn't grow in, in New York. But you know they allowed me to work on papaya. And uh, that, that really, to me, uh, sets apart Cornell from much. And I, I, I am very dear to the Geneva campus. And uh, to my experience, it's been great. But I want to talk to you about the evolution you know, I used to call it a transgenic papaya store, but now I'm calling it the evolution because you find that the GMOs have evolved at least from a controversial standpoint. But I just, since uh, Margaret has done a, such a great job on uh, the background, I'm going to fast forward, pass by the molecular biology, and I'm just going to give you a pictorial essay, essentially, of our work. Um, now, this is the famous uh, solo papaya in Hawaii, and I must say, Hawaii produces the best papaya in the whole world. Now, like everything, it's affected by viruses. So uh, this is the papaya ring spot virus, worldwide importance. Um, it affects the fruit, and it, it's, it's a major problem. Now, me being from Hawaii and coming to this cold country, no, cold state, uh, I had to find out the reason so I could go back to Hawaii and just do some work. So, in uh, 1978, I just come to Cornell, and the Dean of Agriculture at the College of um, University of Hawaii said, hey, there's a virus in Puna where 95% of papayas is being grown, and the virus is in Hilo, only 19 miles away. And he said, what if the virus ever gets into Puna? I said, you're going to be devastated. So, you know, I just come, I went, came back to Cornell. Then the dean calls me up. He said, I'm going to give you $5,000 to work on this. I said, you got it. I'm going to solve the problem with $5,000. <laughs> well, anyway, so, and this is a public sector. This is what I want you folks to pay attention to. This is about public sector doing the work, not big companies. So, and, you know, I said, Geneva was elected was electric. So we started working in 1985. Just about that time, John Sanford had invented the gene gun. And Margaret said, somehow, you have to get these genes into the plant. And he was just across the building from me. So we got all, we cooperate with University of Hawaii, USDA. We took our little tissues into Sanford's lab shot it with, uh, this was the father of the gene gun, used blank 22 caliber bullets to fire. I'm not joking, and 1991, this picture was taken at the greenhouses in Geneva. On the left side was a papaya that had a small gene from the virus. We had essentially vaccinated 
his papaya to be resistant. And on the right side was this papaya that did not have the gene. And can you see this? I mean, you don't have to be a molecular biologist to see the difference. And I said, oh my gosh, 1991. Now, this, you want to know the secret of this kind of success? You got to go for the juggler. You know, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time doing a lot of genetics like Margaret. Hey, let's go to the field. So by 1992, we were in the field. And then it looked beautiful. So 1978, they said to work on the virus. 1992, we were in the field. May 1992, the long-awaited invasion of the papaya ring spot virus enters Pune. Pune on the left, 1992, beautiful papaya. Here, now it's devastated. So now, we work to develop the project here. We did a field trial in Pune, and look, see the, on the left, non-genetically engineered papaya, on the right, genetically engineered, far right, a solid block of the rainbow papaya, and surrounding this infected. And I remember, the growers coming and turning the corner and they looked at the point and said, oh my gosh, when can we get it? And we said, no, you can't get it now because it's not deregulated yet. So in football terms, our project had entered the red zone. You know, <laughs> you do the research all the way to the 20 yard, it's like Super Bowl. When you hit the 20 yard line, let's say they've entered the red zone. Well, the industry was in trouble. We had a potential solution. Public sector, no millions of dollars. It was us two-bit researchers that had to do all the deregulation. We had to write all of these things and so forth. But we were racing against time. But you know, our motive was to help the growers. And that's what I learned at the Geneva campus. You do research to help people. So we worked on it, and uh, we got it uh, um, you know, commercialized. And now 85% of Hawaii's papaya is genetically engineered. Now, who said about public perception people don't like GMOs? No. In Hawaii, they love the papaya, but you see up there, that picture was taken of me uh, the early part of 2014. Hey, I was a big hero. Papaya, a GMO success story. The same newspaper, the same newspaper, put it headlines several months ago. What did they say? GMO banned on the big island of Hawaii. But they exempted the papaya. But the theme here is feeding the world. What if GMO is the solution? But the big thing Ronnie is talking about, public perception. And you know, I'm, let me check here how much time I have, a few minutes. But I, I retired, I'm a has-been. But, but you know, I can say this because I retired. If I was Cornell, I was the dean of the College of Agriculture. I'd want Cornell to continue the leadership. This papaya story is a product of Cornell, but that was years ago. What new public sector things are gonna develop so you can do it? So my challenge to Cornell is that you don't have to worry about the big companies. They're gonna do the stuff, you don't need to worry. But part of our mission of the public sector universities is to help people. And the papaya story was something that we did to help people, but there is controversy. How are you gonna overcome the controversy? It's not so much science. I am absolutely confident in the science. It's gonna keep on improving. But when you hit that red zone, it's not about just science. It's about people skill. It's about strategy. 
you look at Brady when he, there's two minutes left in a game. He's not defensive. He's figuring out how he's going to score the touchdown. And that's what we have to, unless we take that kind of attitude, I don't know what the question is going to be about, the answer is going to be about feeding the world if GMO is the only solution. And I'm prejudiced because, you know, uh, Cornell helped me do this project. But I feel the public sector has a huge role in this. And I look forward to Cornell continuing the lead in this evolution of GMOs. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Wonderful job, and thanks for finishing on time, even with a minute to spare. So our next speaker is Rick Kress. He's president of the Southern Garden Citrus, a subsidiary of U.S. Sugar, which is one of the largest growers of oranges in Florida and a major supplier of not-from-concentrate orange juice to the major brands and private label grocery trade. Rick graduated from Cornell in 1973 with a BS in food science. He's been employed in the fruit, juice, and vegetable industry for 42 years in a variety of senior management positions with companies that include Libby, McNeil and Libby, Nestle, Seneca Foods, and Northland Cranberries Incorporated. In September 2005, Rick joined the Southern Garden Citrus Management Team where he is directly involved with current disease issues impacting the citrus industry industry today. Rick serves on the Cornell University Institute of Food Science Advisory Council as well as the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station Advisory Council Task Force. He's married, has three children, and ten grandchildren. Please welcome Rick. I started in this process 42 years ago, June 1, after graduating from Cornell. I moved to Southern Gardens on September 20th, 2005. The first weekend I was there, we were burning 4,500 acres of citrus due to canker. On October 5th, 2005, we found greening in our groves. On October 24th, 2005, Hurricane Wilma hit and wiped out 53% of our crop. So it's been a piece of cake ever since. <laughs> citrus greening, AKA Huang Long Bing. It's considered to be the most serious challenge that the National Academy of Sciences has ever dealt with in their entire history. It's a bacterial disease. It's never been cultured. It's transmitted by an insect. Public enemy number one, the Asian citrus psyllid. This is an insect in Florida that's as prevalent as the mosquito. The symptoms of this disease, um, you can see a variety of different discolorations in leaves and so on and ultimately it will kill the tree. What's it do to the fruit? Basically, it's an immature fruit. It will be misshapen. It will not mature properly, and it is a very poor flavor. We won the lottery in 2005 in a backhanded way. This property you're looking at is on the northernmost edge of the Everglades. It's 17,000 acres. That's where the disease was first found in Florida. The day we found it, we said we need to learn and learn quickly. We know very little about this disease. It's been in Brazil since 2004, and it's been in the world for years, but we didn't know much about it. What's our management plan? What are we going to do? Brazil had it. China had it for several years. The best practice was to basically control the vector through chemicals, inspect the groves for infected trees, get rid of the infected tree, and replant with disease-free trees, and find a researcher network. That's why we're at Cornell. This disease, if you see up in the, in the center top, that light-colored leaves, when the insect infects a tree, it can be 18 months to 24 months before you can see the symptoms in that tree. So it's not one thing to find the insect, but you have at least two years before you know you have the disease. There's two things we know in Florida and in the citrus industry about this disease. Number one, you have to have good nutrition. Number two, you can't wait to find the insect. You have to assume it's there. Watch how fast this goes through Florida. And if you look at the top left corner of that first upper red 
uh, County, that's where our Grove is located. This is how fast it moved through the state of Florida in the span of three years. Every Grove in the state of Florida today is infected. The Grove I showed you where we found it, each one of these blocks is 10 acres. Each one of those dots is an infected tree that we removed. Watch. We have lost 800,000 trees to this disease out of our property. What's the solution? How do we get something behind the tractor? Because the bottom line is we have a severe challenge. There's multiple steps. We have research, we have regulatory approval, we have agriculture, and we have consumer. All four pieces have to go at the same time. Bottom line from a research perspective, the Florida industry in of itself has over 135 projects that it's working on today. The industry in the last five years has spent in excess of $75 million to find a solution to this disease. We have short-term challenges. How do we manage to stay in business? We have medium-term. How do you replant when a tree takes as long to grow? What do you do? And then long-term, how do we find a resistant tree? From the regulatory side, all three agencies are directly involved. They are our friend. They have a job to do. We meet with them, we sit down, we talk. They share what they want done. We talk about what we're doing. Everything they do, everything they require is by law. We have a safe food supply in this country for a reason. Bottom line on agriculture, if we find a resistant tree today, to develop that new tree, to get it to the point to put it in the ground is two years. We put it in the ground today, it's three years before we get measurable fruit. And it's a total of five to seven years after planting before we get a return on that investment. Consumer acceptance. After the EPA, after FDA, after USDA approvals, we know it can be safe for the environment, people, and animals, but we have to make sure that we have the right source of gene. Is this a challenge that it's a nicety or a necessity? We are faced with an issue in the citrus industry today that we are on the verge of collapse in the United States. It's got to be done right. So, as of today, biotechnology offers the greatest possibility of addressing this disease. If we could find another solution outside of biotechnology, we would be in it today. Benefits. We will have a citrus industry in the United States. No other country in the world can compare to Florida orange juice day in and day out for quality. Brazil produces three times the amount of citrus we do, but they can't match our quality. And finally, we have the opportunity through biotechnology to eliminate a significant amount of chemicals. To control this insect in our groves, our growing costs have gone up 40%. The price of our juice has not gone up 40%. We are applying so many approved chemicals to our groves that our groves are basically sterile. We're trying to kill that insect, but what else are we doing? If we can eliminate that use of chemicals through a resistant tree, we have an environmental benefit. So with all that being said, we're moving forward. We feel we have an acceptable approach. We're covering all four buckets at the same time. Data says we have resistance. But here's a challenge, and everybody's going to touch on this today. We're expected to feed the world. We have to use less water, use less chemicals, use less land and conserve it, protect wildlife, satisfy all the regulations, improve quality, and oh, by the way, do it cheaper. If we don't use science, we're in trouble. A couple of pictures here. This is a grower. April 2007, you see the picture in the middle up the upper left of the, the lighter colored tree. This is how his grove has progressed as we went through. This last picture shows he thinks he's got a pretty good tree there. That's a pathetic tree, but that's the best he's got after five years. This is what happens to a tree in Florida today that's infected. It's just like any other living function. When you're sick, when you're stressed, you try to stay alive. The trees are dropping their fruit. We have lost this last year, 10 years ago, the industry had 240 million boxes of fruit. 
A box is 90 pounds. This year, we will be less than 100 million boxes. We are to a point that infrastructure-wise, if we go much lower, we will be losing processing operations. This is the example of where the crops have gone. This is a picture of our processing operation. We squeeze 25,000 oranges a minute. We produce 600,000 gallons of orange juice a day. I could process all of the grapefruit in the state of Florida and, and I would still have extra capacity in this operation. This is an asset that is in danger of going away. We, the big white buildings are storage tanks for orange juice. We have 56 million gallons of juice at any given time. It's a daunting task. We have an end goal in sight, but we have a significant challenge as we go forward. We are working very closely with Cornell on a variety of op opportunities. We're, we're, we've got solutions, but we're working with Mother Nature. So the last point I want to pass, not related directly to this challenge, but relates to the orange juice category. And I close every presentation this way. I want you to buy orange juice. And if you don't want to drink it, I don't care. Throw it away. Just buy it. <laughs>
I, you know, I've heard that the, that, that the GMOs cause cancer in rats. I have to make sure I look into that before I write this story. And my editors were like, okay, when is the story going to be filed? <laughs> like, don't, aren't we going to have something to publish in our newspaper soon? But I felt like I had to check out every, every um, allegation that was brought up about genetic engineering because I wanted to be right. I didn't want to publish anything that was, um, that was inaccurate. And every time I, I found something, I would check it out, and it would, just, it would, it would turn out not to have... Uh, substance in scientific substance. So, um, so I set out on this journey, knowing you know very little about knowing very little about GMOs. And I, I my first call um, actually was to uh, a professor at UC Davis. So, sorry, it wasn't Cornell. I should have called should have called Margaret Smith. But um, but all other all other paths in my reporting actually somehow led to Cornell. So it was only fair that we included someone from another university. Anyway, so I called this um, expert at uh, plant biologist, Pamela Ronald at, at UC Davis, and I said, look, I, I don't know that much about GMOs. Can you just you know, give me some background? And, um, and she said, well, you know, what do you mean GMOs? Like, which, which GMO are you talking about? And that was the beginning of my education, because I kind of was like, well, GMOs, you know, those things that are Monsanto makes them, <laughs> and um, and you know they have to do with pesticides. Um, and I've heard that you know all my friends who I mentioned that I was going to write about this are telling me that they don't you know they make sure they don't buy anything that has GMOs in it. So you know I just I just want to know about GMOs. So she sent me um, uh, she talked to me and she actually told me a lot of what M Margaret very um, succinctly <laughs> told you. It took me somehow months to absorb all that information that you talked about in ten minutes. But um, so she she listed the types of GMOs that there were, and she said, yeah, maybe you'll be interested in this. I'm going to send you an article. And she sent me an article that was actually a profile of Dennis Gonzalez um, that had been published actually in the New York Times a year or so earlier. And it was all about the papaya, the genetically engineered papaya. And in that article, and so, and, and so this papaya, as Dennis told you, wasn't, first of all, made by Monsanto. And it didn't have any, if it had something to do with pesticides, it, it, it had to do with the fact that the farmers in, in, on the Big Island of Hawaii were spraying more pesticides because they were trying to control the insect that spreads that disease. And this allowed them to, to not spray anymore. In that article, um, there was a small, like one or two sentence mention uh, that there was this thing in Florida, <laughs> that um, this terrible disease that was affecting oranges, and, and a sort of a speculation that maybe maybe genetic engineering would, would come in handy there too. So I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, maybe I could look at Florida. I wonder, I wonder if that has come to pass. Because <laughs> this article was, was, I think, in 2011, this article that I was reading, reading about. And I was reading about it in, in early 2012. So I called up Rick Kress, who um, took my call. <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised. Because you know, genetic engineering is a touchy subject. And so if, if the Florida industry was actually exploring this, I didn't, I didn't really expect them to want to talk to me. But for some reason, Rick did agree to talk to me. And this, he's already showed you the kind of the horrifying uh, pictures, but this is another picture. And I mean, I think this is why he chose to talk to me, because they were facing something that was really horrible with no apparent other solution. And uh, this is, you know, I just think a striking picture of the scariness of this disease. They had tried everything else to control it, and they couldn't. And so Rick was, was looking into genetic engineering options. Um, he, he talked about burning trees. This picture was actually on the front page of the New York Times um, in July of last year, uh, along with my article, which finally did I finally did manage to get in the paper after after I learned a lot about genetic GMOs. Um, <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time with Rick, probably more time than he ever intended to spend with me. But I learned a lot about what they were doing, um, and then you know, so that that story about the potential of genetic engineering to, to um, address a terrible disease um, that would affect, is it 70,000 jobs? I don't think you mentioned the, the industry. It's, it's a lot of people that work in the citrus industry who would be affected. Um, I then wrote about golden rice, which is another type of GMO, which I think you just don't hear about very much. I mean, again, like everyone that I was, even as I was learning more and more about this, my, my educated, you know, well-meaning, science-loving friends were still telling me, like, Gee, you know, GMOs, like, you know, we, we always look for GMO-free in, in the supermarket, you know, so, but, but this um, story was about 
uh, a type of rice that is engineered to produce beta carotene, the precursor to vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency causes childhood blindness and lots of other, because of, uh, it weakens the immune system, it causes death, that de like millions of deaths that don't need to be, <laughs> that wouldn't otherwise happen if people had vitamin A in the developing world. Um, and I wrote about this because um, the rice was being field tested in the Philippines and some protesters broke into the field and ripped up all of the rice plants because they were told or they believed, again, this goes to, goes to the, the, this disconnect between public perception and, and scientific consensus, they were told that you know, this was bad for their health, it was bad for the environment, it was, it was an agent of the multinational corporations who were going to use it as a, as a, like a wedge to get into the, into the country and, and control agriculture. Um, and I tried to explain sort of what the potential benefits of the technology were and, and why, you know, and, and also to try to understand why people were protesting against it. Um, my, the last story that I did, which was published this past January, um, was about, I got to visit the Big Island of Hawaii where I got to meet Dennis in person after reading the profile of him that had started my, my reporting process. Um, but I went there because on the Big Island of Hawaii, um, the kind of myths and um, just misinformation that I had been learning about uh, that was sort of circulating about GMOs um, all across the country, um, and mostly, by the way, that, that has resulted in um, campaigns in many states to, that, to label food, have like sort of warning labels on food that contain genetically modified ingredients. But in, on the Big Island, there was this a movement to ban all cultivation of GMOs. Um, and the, 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 you know, one, actually one local reporter there described it to me as kind of as like, a, like witch trials. Like they would have these um, county council meetings where people would come and just talk about all like, these terrible things about GMOs that had no, no grounding in reality. And then the scientists from the University of Hawaii would come and say, well, you know, this is what we, this is what we know. You know. This is what the World Health Organization and you know, the National Academy of Sciences and all of these scientific bodies that um, had kind of come to the conclusion that GMOs, the current GMOs on the market were safe and for health and for the environment. And it's not that something, some, plant or animal couldn't be engineered that could be harmful, but that there were you know, reliable tests um, involved for, you know, to prevent that from happening. Um, so, so anyway, the county council was sort of confronted with these two very different perspectives, and, uh, and they voted to ban GMOs. And I felt like that was really important to highlight, because I think that it, it, in a way, um, I cared about this subject, and my editors cared about it enough to let me spend 18 months on it because of what other panelists have pointed out, because the world population is growing. We have to feed nine billion people, and climate change is affecting agriculture in ways that you know we really need to have all tools um, at our fingertips. Um, and I, but I cared about it more, honestly, because I think it, it just it, it says something really important about the way that people address any issue that has a sci that science bears on and that is like increasingly every issue that has political import in our in our society in our culture so i felt like if people were sort of denying the science on this issue they could deny it on on any issue and, and it can really affect you know our whole future <laughs> so um i some people liked my my reporting on genetic engineering. This was a nice tweet from Bill Gates about <laughs> the orange story. It says, can GMOs help save Florida's oranges? The, this fascinating New York Times piece is stirring up lots of healthy debate. Um, but many people did not like my GMO reporting. <laughs> and, and here is a picture of me that has been photoshopped. That is my face. That is not my bathing suit. Um, <clears throat> And I am holding the hand of Hugh Grant, who is the chief executive of Monsanto. And this was um, designed by a group called Food Democracy Now, um, a group that you know, advocates for organic food and, and sustainable agriculture, and in many ways, sort of politically, you know, I support a lot of the general things that they stand for. But they have the attitude about GMOs that, that is held by many, still many of my friends, although I have convinced at least some of my friends <laughs> over the course of my reporting to not. Uh, to not uh, so this was designed to mock me and my reporting, but, um, but I stand by it. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and let me invite the panel back up here. What we're going to do, uh, while you all are thinking of some good questions, we're running a little late because uh, some of you had trouble getting here, uh, but we're, we're going to take the time for you to get involved and raise your questions. But I'm going to do at least the first one, and we'll see how that goes, and uh, then we'll at some point open it up to the audience. So the first question is for the panel, why isn't science winning the argument on behalf of biotechnology? Amy, through her investigative reporting, is convinced that all the objections raised by the antis have no evidence in science. Then why, over the last 20 years, has the anti-GMO movement only gotten stronger? Why are people more likely to trust their yoga instructor than scientists or FDA regulators? Where do we get our values? How can Cornell, as a public institution, reach people whose minds reject scientific data? And this is not just the science about GMOs. We can ask those opposed to vaccinating their children for fear of vaccines that cause autism while they reject, si while they reject science. Are these the same people who at one time would have been opposed to technologies like electricity, the automobile, air travel? How does a human being change his or her mind? So who on the panel? Rick's ready. I have a very simple thought process on this. We, everybody in this room related to the food industry and agriculture, has done a very poor job of educating the consumer. Today's consumer thinks that that can of peas that they pick up in the shelf in the grocery store, when the store wants it, they go out to the field, it's already canned, it's already labeled, all they have to do is pick it up. And the bottom line is we have to do a better job of education because we are behind. Um, I, I think in relation to uh, uh, GMOs, um, much of it is, uh, um, at least what I hear in Hawaii, the testimonies were really against, uh, in Hawaii, is the, is the big companies. And it's about potential for controlling the food chain and Roundup Ready and, and all of this stuff. And so I think for, th that's the one reason why, and unfortunately, the, the papaya, for example, uh, is getting caught up in, in this whole uh, stream of uh, anti. And my uh, solution is, is education, but my personal solution is until you get more small specialty craft public sector products out where the consumer can really look at it and feel it, you, you, you still have this problem about the perception that, uh, that GMOs are not good and, and essentially anti-science. Do you have a thought? Yeah, I have a thought. I, Ronnie said he was going to ask one question, and I heard about 15. <laughs> we, won't, we won't go into that. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I really stew about, and it's, it's something I hear when I talk to public audiences, is just, just recently a great example. Somebody raised their hand and said, well, how do we know this isn't just like the trans fats? Everyone told us those were safe and they were good for us, and 50 years later we found out that that was not true. So I think that expresses one of the real challenges we have as scientists. We, we, but it, the irony is it's not unique to this technology. It's true for any technology we use. There are all sorts of technologies we adopt. We never have a guarantee that they are safe for the foreseeable future. And yet, most of them don't raise this level of controversy. So I think we have to be very thoughtful about how to actually address that. You know, we need to be as cautious as we can in thinking forward about what might be the impacts and trying to rule those out that we can imagine. And beyond that, there isn't, in fact, a guarantee. And how do you, how do you convey that message in a way that makes people 
feel yeah. like the the risks that might be there, which we can't necessarily 100% disprove, are in fact acceptable. One of the ways we do that, and I think it, it goes back to what both Rick and Dennis were just talking about, is with products that offer a more clear and direct benefit to consumers. So, you know, risks look a, little, a lot less worrisome if you can actually see what good it's doing you. I think that's what some of the technology suffers from right now. So it's not an answer to your 15 questions, Ronnie, but it's a few thoughts on it. I think also, um, I mean, when I talk to people, you know, Monsanto does come up a lot. <laughs> and I think that people have, like, let's just say, like a legitimate distrust of big business to, you know, uh, look, we live, you know, in a capitalist society. And we know, we all know that companies have a bottom line. They, they're not, they're, they don't, their interest is in making a profit. Um, often to make a profit, you also have to do what is in the public interest, but not always. Um, so people are, are really worried about that. Um, and, and I think that um, historically, it is true, and we should, you know, we should get it out on the table. I mean, I mean, Monsanto's first product, the first big crop that was genetically engineered was soybeans that were designed to withstand, to, to tolerate the herbicide Roundup glyphosate, which Monsanto also made. So Monsanto was was kind of creating a, a, a bigger market for its own herbicide. Now, is that bad? I mean, it's important to, to sort of examine what the trade-offs were, what, what were the alternatives. Um, glyphosate is, is known as a much more benign um, herbicide than many that were being used. Farmers have always tried to kill weeds, and this was just a different way of doing it, and, and an arguably more environmentally friendly way of doing it. But I think um, it's important to sort of understand and, and get, get out you know, what people hear and what they care about. And you know, people want to have their food be safe, and they're worried that it's not going to be safe. And this is something that sounds scary. So I, you know, I agree that it ultimately comes back to education, but um, those are some of the reasons that I hear often. OK, well, we're running a little late, and we really want to involve you. So does anyone have a question? There's one over there. We've got Okay, I think your hand was up first and then here. Is it true that Monsanto has hauled adjacent farmers into court for spillover of genetically modified crop that the farmer next door happens to have on his land and they're now suing for that infringement? Is that true? Because that, that gets back to your thing about yeah, why I, people, I think uh, Amy probably why can answer that. I agree, and I, I looked into that as much as I possibly could, and I know other reporters that also did, like someone at NPR who, who wrote a whole book about this, who I think is a really great reporter, and n as far as I could tell, the answer is no. I mean, that, that is a very commonly circulated assertion about Monsanto. I think what is true about Monsanto is that they, they um, have very litigiously enforced their their... Um, their license agreements, and, and and so there was like there was one famous case where somebody, a farmer, knowingly did planted replanted soybeans that you know were only supposed to be planted once if you bought them from from Monsanto because they had this this pro property in them, and they took him to court, um, you know, but that that they were enforcing a contract essentially. So um, so what the the scenario that you just outlined, I was never actually able to find. Or you're next. Uh, we've got a mic coming here. Please use that. When genetically modified foods are broken down after a person has eaten them into their basic amino acids, starches, fatty acids, is there a difference in those basic components that makes one wonder whether the body has never been exposed to a changed molecule? Um, as far as I'll take the papaya for example, um, there, there, there's, we've analyzed the genetically engineered and non-genetically engineered papaya for all of the natural components, and they're all essentially the same. And uh, the gene that we put in was a, is a virus gene. Now, people have been eating virus-infected papaya for eons, and safe. Um, so, um, e e essentially, my conclusion in the work that we did was to really answer the question, is it really safe for the consumer and for the environment? And once, and again, you, you have to do it scientifically, 
Once I did that, then my, I felt I really had done my job, and then the, hopefully the regulators would agree. Then, then let the market take the uh, the stuff. If they don't want the papaya, that's fine. But we had to answer the question to the best of our ability, it's safe. But with the papaya, is basically no difference except the small little gene that we put in uh, the papaya. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned, Amy, that move on the part of many states to do labeling with regards to genetically modified ingredients. And in fact, Vermont has already passed a law to that effect, and uh, Maine and Connecticut have passed laws that are contingent on other states agree. Given the fact that most of the uh, consumer protests do not seem to be informed, what do you think the response will be in the consumer market should this labeling be required? I, I think that those, those laws are designed to have, to be essentially like a warning label, like a warning label on a pack of cigarettes. It's, it's sort of to say, like, be careful, GMOs inside. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a reporter. I, I'm pro-information. So when I have this discussion with people, people are always like, well, you know, what's wrong with having information? We have a right to know what's in our food. Um, the question I have is, though, what, you know, what are you going to know from that label. And it kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier when my, my first question to, uh, you know, the, the first expert that I talked to about this was, you know, tell me about GMOs. But there is no such thing as GMOs, right? So if you, if there's a, if there's a label on a package that says, you know, this contains GMOs, does that mean that it contains, um, uh, you know, a crop, ingredients from a crop that was designed to resist pests so that farmers didn't have to actually spray pesticides on it? Does it mean that it is from a crop that you know was tolerating herbicides. So, and then you have this whole debate in your head about, well, is that better or worse for the environment? You know, do I want to buy this piece of this, you know, these um, Doritos because they're good or bad for the environment? Was it? Is it? Is it oranges that otherwise? wouldn't be able to be grown if, you know, and so, but you don't know that. You don't know that from a, a label that says GMO. There are so many, I mean, now people are working on on genetically engineered crops that might be able to um, be drought resistant or cold tolerant or, you know, so to me, it, it's actually a misleading label. And, you know, if you're, to your question, how will consumers react? I, you know, I don't know. Maybe they'll go, I mean, the, the one good thing about it might be that it would um, pressure the industry and other, you know, and educational institutions that care about this to educate people more. So, so you know, uh, I, I do think there is a burden out there of education and, and these types of labels. If you don't want them to be misconstrued, people are going to have to go out and educate the public about them. Yes, way in the back over here and then over here. Description is definitely right. I've been working with the American Chestnut Foundation for the last uh, 16 years, and we built up a on-the-ground system with about 35 universities involved, including Cornell. The problem is that there's a little bit too fast of a movement going on here, and the public's going to have a hard time catching up. And it could hurt us more than it helps us in the long run if we don't handle it properly. And I think if the universities like Cornell and others could get more involved in working on that aspect of it while they continue to do research, we've got a better chance at getting a product out there that could work. But right now we're looking at backcross breeding. That's what we do. We'll have a 94% American tree. As many of you know, it was 4 billion trees were lost when the uh, fungus came in from Asia, and that's why we have plant quarantine laws. I just think we need to slow down. I understand about orange juice, and I will go buy some and throw it away if that'll help you keep going. But there, we have to slow down a bit while we still focus faster. And I think it's very important. Thank you. Sounds like a comment, not a question. Yes. Uh, I just also wonder, uh, we're not Please, feeling, please stand. Yes, yeah, we're not the only animal on the planet. So I'm also wondering what the research is finding about how insects and, and animals are affected by the research that's going on. Oh, um, you know, as, if the question is about the impact on, on the animals and, and so forth, well, with the, uh, at least with the tests that we had to do, especially as we 
entered into Japan. You know, Japan is probably the most strictest country, and we got our papaya deregulated in Japan. So we, we have to answer a lot of these questions on the impact, and there's various scientific process that you go, you go, you see how, how uh, gastric juices can degrade the cold protein, or you do all of these kind of studies that, and you see if it's related to allergens. And, and so the, so in studying the transgenic uh, product before it's deregulated, um, yeah, the questions are, will it impact on the animals and insects? I, I believe they, they are addressed, but uh, obviously some people don't agree that they need to be addressed more. I just wanted to make one comment apropos of that, which is, it goes back to what Amy was just saying, but GMO is not a thing. So it's a question that has to be asked for each crop and trait is what might be the side benefits or the risks associated with that particular trait. So there isn't a single answer to that. People are expected to do some of that research when they're trying to get things deregulated, as Dennis mentioned. We had a question right back here, just behind you and then you, sir. Some, someone back there? Did, yeah, I think it was you, please. So if organic farmers feel that it's safe to spray Bt on their crop when they're having an outbreak of an organism that's affecting it, how does that translate to it being safe for every single cell in a Bt GMO crop to have that toxin in it? How does that make it still safe for consumers to consume that plant? <coughs> I don't see any volunteers here, so, well, go ahead, Margaret. I, I can also have a go at that. Go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, I guess that means it's me when there's no volunteers. <laughs> um, so one thing to understand is that the way the Bt toxin works is it um, acts in alkaline guts, and so it only affects a couple families of insects. It has essentially no effect on anything in the mammal world because we have an acid gut. And so it doesn't interact with our gut in the same way. So I think that kind of, the safety of it goes back to our understanding in that case of how it actually functions in the gut. So when I was talking earlier about trying to be as thoughtful as we can about foreseeing where the problems might lie, that's exactly the kind of information we need to have. One of the things that honestly I think about as I think about this, right now we have BT version of cotton, we don't consume a lot of cotton, but we do eat cottonseed oil. There's really no protein or no DNA left in that. It's oil, so not an issue there. It's present in field corn and in sweet corn. Those are the primary crops that are commercialized here in the U.S. right now. We consume a lot more field corn than we think, but again, it's in the form of sugar, starch, oil, things which are purified products for the most part. And then there's the cornflakes and the Doritos and stuff like that. And we do consume sweet corn. But there's a, there's a very old piece of wisdom. It goes back to Paracelsus. And what Paracelsus said is the dose makes the poison. So I do think as BT might be built into more and more different crops, we need to be thoughtful about the question you ask. Our understanding of BT's mode of action is that it in itself is not toxic in any way to mammals because we understand how it works. But if it suddenly were to be in four or five different things that are on your dinner plate all at once, that then becomes a different question that we need to think about. Um, I, I wasn't going to directly address BT, but, but a couple of these questions have been about testing, you know, testing on animals. How do we know it's safe? And um, in the time that I spent with Rick, and I might make you answer a little bit, <laughs> but I wrote, what I wrote about Rick was Rick has a, lot, a few projects going on that he's trying to work on as potential um, genetic engineering solutions to the problem of citrus greening. One of them is to take a protein that is found in spinach and put that in the, in the citrus tree. And uh, that, it, it seems that particular protein, which does, is not in citrus for whatever reason, um, guards against this, bec this particular bacteria that is infecting all of these trees. And, um, and so, uh, 
you know, I said to Rick, well, how, how do we know that's going to be safe? <laughs> and, and he explained to me all of the ways in which it was already being tested. And they were producing, like, I forget how much of this protein to be fed to rats and to be, like, put into honeybee, into the honeybees and to just, I mean, there, there's really extensive testing process that does go on um, that's governed by the EPA. Um, do you, I mean, do you want to say anything? Well, yeah, we have the regulatory side, and then, as I say, we have the consumer side, the wide spectrum of how we have to address this. As we've talked about this, the spinach technology, I've had the basic questions that have said, been said to me, well, is the orange juice going to taste like spinach? <laughs> okay, I mean, so we have a wide, wide process that we have to work our way through. But yes, the regulatory process, you know, I'll say it another way. That's first and foremost of everything that we have to do in our technology, is we have to satisfy the requirements writing a big check to make the spinach protein when I was talking to him. Because you have to make a lot of the protein in order to feed it to rats in order to make sure that, that you know, honeybees weren't affected by it. Which they weren't, right? <laughs> which they weren't. Peter, you had a comment. Microphone over here. Uh, Peter Davies, Professor of Plant Sciences here, Cornell. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments with regard to two of the questions. First of all, BT toxin. This is a scary word, toxin. What you need to know is it's actually a protein which, uh, as Margaret described, binds to just cells in an insect gut. It's a protein that in an animal gut is broken down. Uh, as any protein in your diet. How do we know that? Trial after trial after trial. There are something like 1,800 papers in the scientific literature attending, attesting to the safety of these products. So it's not just, oh, well, it's safe. They've been tested and tested and tested for allergy and for breakdown. Also, uh, a lot of this is fed to cattle. We know exactly where it goes. We know the fate in the manure. We know that that uh, passes straight through. It's broken down in the soil. What speed is it broken down in the soil, etc. Another question I would like to address was the question with regard to safety to uh, insects. There have been studies that have been reported following, for example, uh, the insect-resistant cotton, 30 sites followed over 13 years, and this is published in the prestigious journal Nature. And they looked at all the, the insects in the population in the field, including the predatory insects, and they found that the predatory insects, those are the ones that attack other insects that might be harmful to your crop. These were flourishing compared to conventional agriculture which sprays insecticides. So there was a significant benefit to the insect population. And this has been done now, not only in the study I just mentioned, but several other institutions. And finally, an answer to one of the questions about uh, safety when you're eating them. Uh, the best answer to this is this has been looked at by every scientific organization worldwide and these GMO crops have been declared to be exactly the same as non-GMO crops. And this includes the European Food Safety Authority in GMO versus Europe. And they came out with a very big study that had that exact conclusion. There is no difference to the environment or for food, uh, comparing GMO and non-GMO crops. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Sarah, please. Uh, if biotechnology can reduce chemical use, shouldn't it be considered the new organic? Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> um, 
That's, that's a pretty solid question, Sarah. And, and I can tell you that's some of the discussions that, that we've had directly with the USDA and so on. But first and foremost, from our perspective, we've got to find a solution. And, and that's, that's where our emphasis has been. But there is an opportunity there. But that one's going to take some real work. But it is, it is viable, because if we can eliminate the chemicals, then, then it, there needs to be some reconsideration. I'll, uh, I'll join in on that, not so much for the, well, the chemicals, because they spray chemicals to uh, control the virus, which doesn't work. But, you know, my, my take on uh, uh, virus resistance uh, crops, there's nothing more sustainable, nothing more organic than something that is resistant. You want something sustainable, you have it resistant. And I, I think that whole thing is being missed where, when they, they just take out, they just brand it GMO. As you make it resistant, it's good for the environment and everything. That has to be con considered when you talk about sustainability and 2050 uh, feeding the world. I mean, I, th I think it is really odd. It was always struck me as this um, sort of contradiction that well, I think when people buy organic, they think, at least I do, like I think about, uh, I don't want chemicals on my food, so I'm going to buy organic. And yet here, like in the case of the orange, possibly, and, and in the case of the papaya, you have these crops that, that allow just that, but that are, are, not, uh, are barred from being considered. I always thought that it would be interesting to go back and do the, the real research into how the organic standard got formed. Um, I wasn't around then or, or looking at this then, but I, I, my understanding is that it was actually on the table that genetic and gen genetically engineered crops could be included in the organic definition that, that the USDA was forming in the early 90s, and that there was a lot of lobbying, and it was sort of a, you know, a political and economic battle because um, some food companies and food growers felt like they would have a market advantage by kind of shutting out um, genetic engineering from that definition. But um, it would be interesting if it could ever be reconsidered, <laughs> to your point. Bill. I'm Bill Lacey. I'm a, an alum as well as a Davis professor. Um, very, very stimulating conversation. I really appreciate the balance you've provided. Um, I've done some work in this area for 20 or 30 years, as Ronnie knows, and so does Margaret, um, from a different perspective. And I think your panel brought out some of those issues that we raised as well. The complexity of attitudes that people hold. Not the biological issues, but the complexity of attitudes that people hold. And they hold them for various reasons. So one of my questions would be, what role do you see the social scientists playing in understanding why people accept or don't accept the GMOs. The second that I think came out in this discussion was the difference in the way in which the public sector approaches research and perhaps how the private sector approaches research. And I have done some work to discover the very different cultures of science in those two communities. So the second question I would ask you is, what role do you see for a independent, viable public sector research system? Anybody want to take that on? you got to answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the social scientists could help us a lot in improving our communications with the public, and we're looking at beefing that up. I think universities have a duty, including especially the social scientists, to lean in on, on this thing and really uh, inform people. I, I think we're, to some extent, remiss in, in waiting this long and not leaning in as a public institution and really uh, trying to communicate uh, the correct information uh, to the public. A anybody else want to? And then the second question, Bill, was the public sector role. I think, Dennis, your, your view of that is one you ought to. Yeah. Well, you know, um I, I firmly believe that the, the land-grant universities were created to help the public. And I, I expect private companies to do products because they need to make money. But the, the public sector needs to address problems to help people. And I think the public sector 
the universities or whatever, have the best chance to bring in the human element of biotechnology. You know, too much we talk about this technology, but the human element, you know, when people in Hawaii come up to me and say, hey, Dennis, I am so happy you developed the papaya because I eat it every day for my digestion, and I can buy it for 89 cents a pound. And, and you know, if it's $10 a pound, the, the, most people are not gonna buy it. But see, that was done by a public sector because it wasn't about us gonna make money. In fact, Amy knows how much money I made from all of this stuff. But, um, but it's about, we were out to solve problems. And I, I always thought that I thought it was a public sector, universities, to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I do think it's a really important point. Like I said earlier, you know, people, people have a legitimate distrust of large companies. Um, and if, if genetically engineered crops were coming from public institutions that, that you know, were publicly funded or were, were specifically invented for the public interest, I think people would have a different attitude toward them. You know, there's... Oh, okay, we're got, I'm going to take the one last question back here, and then I'm going to wrap up with one question from, that I have for the panel. Please, sir. Medical field now, doctors are required to say they're being paid by the company when they're talking about a product here. And as a weak human being, we get concerned in this area also. If Monsanto's going to pay for the study, and the study comes out, and we're a little wary about it as a weak human being. I think, okay. Dennis, that's exactly sure. what you were talking about. You want to? Um, well, you know, um, with, with the papaya, you know, it, it, it's complex. Uh, Cornell had, had the patent on the coprotein gene, but to develop the papaya, we had to use a 35S promoter owned by Monsanto, and it had to use uh, cannabis and stuff. And very interestingly, as we were in a heat of battle to try to get the papaya deregulated. I was sitting in an audience like this, and a farmer said, oh my gosh, it's working, but we'll never get it commercialized. And I said, why? Monsanto is gonna charge $10 million. I said, how do you know that? Oh, this is what I heard. And I said, you know, you don't wanna believe everything you heard. Why didn't you go hire a lawyer? I know this lawyer working with us at Cornell. Monsanto essentially gave the rights to the papaya industry. All I'm saying is that very few public sector universities are going to have all the rights. You're going to have to play ball with other people, and much of them are going to be the private sector. But that, that's the game you have to play in order to pierce the red zone and make something commercial. Okay, uh, I'm sorry that we just don't have the time for all of you to get your questions in, but let's, let's think about one question for the panel as we wrap up. What are the consequences of inaction? Inaction if we continue to resist biotechnology. Uh, are the consequences different for developed nations than for developing nations? Maybe start with Margaret. Oh, thanks a lot, We were right across here. <laughs> okay, so I guess by being on the right, I get the right to respond first. Um, you know, I think the... Um, I, I would ask, Ronnie, what inaction by whom? Because I'm not sure that I see inaction. I see action in the form of people opposing the technology. I see action in the form of people supporting the technology. A lot of the arguments from both of those sides of the spectrum are painted in extreme terms that are only tenuously related to reality. So I think, and I also see action in the middle of the spectrum in terms of educational institutions trying to help people understand what we know from the science and what we don't know, and um, where the areas of question lie and where the areas of scientific consensus lie. So I don't think we're, I don't think we're at any risk of inaction. Um, I, I see lots and lots of action. Um, I think we need to judiciously use this technology, and the risks, if we don't do that, 
are ones that you've heard about as in the form of examples today. I mean, the citrus greening is a fantastic example. It's one of those areas where I don't see another choice. So we can choose to have no citrus industry in Florida, or we can choose to try and do something about it. And I think if this were a technology that had been used in those kind of situations from the outset, we might not be in the same position we are right now. I do think the consequences are different for developed and developing nations because the questions and the agriculture and the challenges are different. Uh, many of the developing nations are in the tropics. They don't benefit from our single greatest integrated pest management approach here, which is winter. Um, <laughs> pests continue to grow year round. The pressures are much, much, much higher. The pressures on the food system will be higher. The demand for food is going to be higher. And the impact of climate change is going to be greater. So I think the, the stakes for the developing nations at this point in time are very much higher than they are here. And I'll end there. Yeah, I think uh, Ronnie did not mean that uh, th there's no action by the researchers to uh, do a lot of stuff. I, I think he meant that uh, I go back to the red zone. You know, you, you do a lot of work, but biotechnology is a translational science. You want to feed the world, you're going to judge by whether they're being fed. So if, if there's no inaction, for example, um, the public sector, they, there's only two problems. Well, there's only one product, the papaya. And I mean, one product, the papaya? So in that sense, there's inaction. There's very few stuff coming from the public. But will it change the advent? I think private companies are going to move forward. If they see that they're going to make money, they're going to move forward and they're going to do that stuff. But that's fine. They need to make money. But uh, if there's inaction from the other people, let's say the public sectors on that, then essentially the 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 spectrum gets, gets skewed to, to what these big companies want. Great. I'll go last. From the citrus perspective, we can live without orange juice. We don't have to have citrus in, in the United States. We could get all of the orange juice we need from Brazil, all the fresh fruit we want from South Africa or Mexico. But really, when you look at it, is use citrus as an example in this process of where we're moving forward in order to feed the world. Today, it's citrus. What's the next item if we don't use science to protect it? It could be a trend that, that, that we're moving towards. We can do without orange juice. But there may be other things we can't. I, I like the, the question because I think that so often um, uh, discussion about genetically engineered food is 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 takes place around this notion of risk. Like, well, why should we take the risk that it could harm such and such? You know, th that it could spread in the environment, or maybe you know we'll find out 30 years in the future that you know it, there was some health effect, or you know th there might be some tiny risk that we haven't discovered yet, despite all of our regulatory regimes and all the testing that these things go through, and the fact that we've you know, for the ones that are out there now, they've been being consumed for, you know, almost two decades. Um, what if there's like some tiny risk that we haven't perceived and, and you know, why should, we, why should we put any risk? But I do think there is a risk of, you know, it's, it's, you have to, and this might be where the social scientists could come in. You know, why, how do people perceive risk and why, why are they perceiving it in this particular way? Because when I think about the risk of, you know, half a million children in the developing world going blind because they don't have enough vitamin A and the potential that, I'm not saying, and I should say before I say this, because it's important to say that golden rice does not yet exist, it's not yet been proven effective, it's not, but, but okay, but, but, but there's research being done into that that, that many people have, have said should, should not be done. Um, so why, but, but that seems like such a, such, a, such a vastly worse risk to like not let that kind of thing be tried. Um, so I, 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 I think there is a risk of inaction. Well, I think Annie brought up a good point. You know, what are the alternatives? For instance, in the developing world, the alternatives to BT are insecticides, in some cases not well regulated. And the impact of these insecticides can be tremendous. I remember uh, someone at one of our conferences uh, 
asking an Indian farmer who was on the stage, you know, what had been the impact of BT cotton. And this was a reporter who was, you know, looking for a negative reaction. And the farmer said, oh, it has been wonderful. I mean, he said, the frogs are back, the birds are back. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful, he said. Really, he was so uh, sincere about it. I, I always remember it. And we're, we, Cornell's involved now with the, uh, using the same uh, uh, BT protein in eggplant, which you might be surprised to know is the largest user of insecticide in the world after cotton. It's huge, and that part of the world uses a lot of eggplant, India, uh, especially South Asia. Farmers spray 80, 90 times on a crop, and they're spraying in this, you know, with a bare back, bare legs, bare feet, uh, no protective clothing, whatever. So that's, you know, that's the alternative. And there are other alternatives that, you know, we have to consider. We've talked today about papaya and, uh, and, and uh, citrus, but there's bananas. Bananas are greatly uh, at risk from uh, what's called Panama disease, tropical race uh, four. Coffee is at serious risk from coffee rust, which is spreading uh, widely. Cassava. Is, which a lot of poor people in the world depend on, is at serious risk from various virus diseases. So in several important cases, the alternatives are, as far as we know, are, are quite bleak. So I hope uh, you've enjoyed